Hey, hello everyone. Um, today we have another guest at uh, Mind Your Own Revisions podcast, Hendrik Hutov from uh, Germany. I hope I am pronouncing your name yes. right. <laughs> Good. Welcome, Hendrik. Thanks for yeah, uh, thank making you for time me. for this. Yes, um, my pleasure. So we, we met uh, in, at the Remo event, not the conference that happened recently, but the, the one before that. And I was really impressed by uh, by you making mental health a priority in your university at, at the Jena uh, School for Microbial Communication. Uh, uh, that because... is part of the Friedrich Schill University in Jena. That's, I mean, the... Uh, the Jena School for Microbial Communication is a graduate school for microbiology. Um, my employer is the Friedrich Schiller University Jena. Yes. So, uh, just one question before we even start: Like, are yes. you, are, you, you are, you have a kind of service that you developed with regard to uh, giving mental health first aid to to mostly PhD students, I presume, but all all. Uh, researchers that would need it is yeah. this for only your school uh, no. of graduate school or the whole university it's um it's expanded now to the entire university and that means students and staff everybody at our university can um, contact our mental health first aid team um and that's for anybody who struggles with their mental health or well-being they can contact us um we always try to make it clear we are not therapists we don't make any diagnoses but we are we are trained as mental health first aiders to assist anybody who's in distress and see if we can find the right solutions together amazing amazing work so thank you for that and thank you for like opening the the way to many other universities that never thought of doing such a thing so i will definitely try to bring that to belgium as well but that is not the uh topic of conversation today uh before i mention that i want to introduce hendrik like who yeah. well hendrik is the head of education at the Jena school for uh microbial communication as we said and he's a mental health first aider for researchers for academics as we already mentioned but he's also a big advocate for mental health and mental well-being um at graduate education in academia in general i would say in general in general definitely but you're a big advocate and you you work a lot um not only for the mental health of of um people in tertiary education and graduate school and all of that but also uh you help them shape their career trajectories and you you do a lot of things around that well yeah i mean it, some of that of course is my professional responsibility i'm i manage a phd program career development career development support is part of that um so yeah i, I do do that as well yeah. but that is my job yeah. i would say the mental health angle is more advocacy something that i do out of conviction out of engagement out of um a sense that something needs to change yeah yeah so we, we said advocacy work. I want to mention two organizations that you're affiliated with uh, besides your your job, yes. uh, because you said it's your job to do that, but you only you don't do it only in your job, but you do it for other people as well, as mm -hmm. much as you can. Uh, one of them that you mentioned is Uniwind uh, in Germany. It's a, as far as I could understand, it's an organization that, that helps young scientists like uh, go through, navigate the, the challenges of graduate education and their early career uh, challenges and so. Which... So UniWind is the German University Association. Mm -hmm. Every German university can become a member of that. Mm -hmm. And indeed they have a focus on developing early uh, career academics perspectives, yeah. um, whether that be through advice on career development or curriculum building yeah. and i currently chair the working group on mental health and our working group is due to publish a report 
with recommendations for German universities um, in the course of next year. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, yeah. And UniWind is, is a wonderful platform to do so. Um, we've got a team of roughly 20 members from all sorts of different universities in Germany, um, Bremen, Hanover, Berlin, Bielefeld, small and big universities. And that's really interesting. So we see how um, mental health is becoming more and more important topic and how it's being dealt with in, in this really diverse academic landscape that we have in Germany. Yeah. And yeah. so we will hopefully come with some general recommendations that work for everybody, but there will also be perhaps some more specific recommendations that, that work in larger or smaller setups or situations. So that's really interesting. Mark. That's amazing. Well, thank you for starting this work, like being a pioneer in this area. And there's another one that's more like related to mental health, uh, if I understand correctly. It's okay. I'm pronouncing it German. Irrsinnig mm menschlich. -hmm. That's perfect. Yes. <laughs> Madly human. That's cool. I love Madly the human. name. And it is yeah. uh, especially targeting the students, right, in the secondary and tertiary education in terms of mental health and mental well-being. Um, Oh. So, yeah, Irrsinnig Menschlich, in English, Madly Human, is a charity based in Leipzig, and they are specifically uh, about prevention work for mental health, so informing people about mental health, stigma re reduction, and they go into primary schools even already. Um, they also have programs for children of um, uh, addicted parents, or, or parents with other issues that have impact on the children. Um, but also in secondary schools, they inform about mental health and they have a specific program for universities. That's what I'm involved with. That primarily targets undergraduates. And that is called, uh, in English, um, mentally fit on campus. Uh -huh. uh, the um, German title is Psychisch Fit Studieren. And these are two hour fora that universities can request there's a small fee um, to cover some of the costs but a lot of it is sponsored as well and that is um, a two-hour forum where we inform about mental health risks and and uh, warning signs but where also at every forum there is somebody with lived experience present who normally during their student years or so would have had a mental health condition and talks from the personal perspective about what that means. And, and in that capacity, I'm part of the team because during my master's and PhD, I had a mental health condition myself, um, which was an anxiety disorder. And I just want to make a quick note because today's chat, I understand, is not really going to be about mental health. We want to talk about toxic working cultures, but the two subjects often go hand in hand. Um, but as regards anxiety disorders, I think a lot of, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it, um, as there is a lot of misunderstanding about it, uh, most mental health conditions. But it, it, people might think that that means you're anxious or nervous. No. In my case, I had a severe anxiety disorder, and that means debilitating fear. That means not being able to leave your room sometimes for days on end because you are just completely afraid of stepping out on the street and it's totally irrational fears but they are very real for the person suffering from it so um so that had a very very major impact on my life but i did manage to be um still productive and that is i think quite often the case particularly at universities you have very bright people who, despite a condition that really impacts them, find ways of still passing their exams, still making a master's degree, still getting a PhD. And, and um, so I always want us to make this point that a mental health condition does not preclude you from being effective or even successful professionally. But um, I do want to encourage people to look at their well-being and say well is this really the way i want to live or could i have a better quality of life if i went and tackled perhaps my mental health problem exactly that's so true 
I, I also had a similar lived experience with that. But in my case, it was like, yeah, okay, I can have a mental health issue and I can be productive until I can't. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's a really good issue. One. There is also this, this because the, the, that part of the story makes you more vulnerable to burnout. And then once you get there, it is Precise. more difficult to get out. But yeah. And as you said, we are going to talk about toxic work culture today. And hopefully another time we can dive more deeper into this mental yeah. health. Well, I, I see a really interesting parallel with mental health and toxic working cultures. Because sure, of the course, thing that you because... mentioned that um, d- d- you can't function until you can't. And it's, it's well known in mental health that most people, most people who suffer from mental health conditions, they take bet- on average between seven or eight years from the onset of the disease until they are ready to accept that they've got a problem or they've hit some sort of crisis point that is unavoidable and they have to face up to it. And then they seek um, therapy. And a lot of this has got to do with stigma. You don't want to be branded as crazy or mad or whatever. Um, and so that acceptance of having a mental health condition is extremely difficult. That was actually for me the most difficult, uh, uh, the hardest thing to accept. Mm. And once I did, actually, then everything went better. I found uh, found the right therapy, and and actually, my problem was was fixed very quickly. Then, a similar thing happens, I think, in toxic working cultures. It there it takes a long time to realize that it, it's not you who are at fault in this whatever is making you unhappy at work but that it is actually the environment or the boss or certain colleagues uh, and certainly in academia we de- we tend to look at ourselves and think we're not good enough and and you know this is this is science after all this is the, the front line of knowledge is not never going to be easy so i think we often downplay the red flags that are out there and I'm, I feel pretty confident in saying that a lot of people stay in toxic working environments in academia far too long. Um, in analogy to a mental health condition that you also don't recognize for the problem it is far too long. Yeah. And indeed, a uh, toxic working environment happened to myself as well. Yeah. yeah, it's like this uh, the story of a frog being uh, thrown in the water and the, you slowly start boiling the water and then frog just gets used to it as the temperature increases and it doesn't jump out. So it's the, the same thing. Very good example. Uh, but I think now we are at the perfect spot to start talking about the article <laughs> that you published back in 2019. Uh, called the courage to leave right yes uh that was in, in that was published in science and yes, that was part of their working life series where every week they have a scientist discuss any personal aspect of their professional careers yeah um, but and, un- uh, unfortunately at that time maybe probably it still is this like uh toxic work cultures and leaving such toxic work cultures would see would be seen as a personal thing right yes. it's not a yes. oh, it's not systematic it's just oh yeah it's, tell us about your personal difficulties this is a, a systematic uh thing unfortunately going on in academia for many many decades uh but i am very happy that finally it is coming out in the media in the recent uh, articles published in Nature about how graduate students and postdocs are being abused, especially in the US. But although we see that the US picture more uh, in the media, we also, you and I know that it is happening mm. a lot in continental Yeah, America. I would say it's not, I wouldn't say that it is happening in the US, but I would say that in the US, particularly through platforms such as uh, Science Magazine, which is American, of course, um, they are really at the front line of addressing these issues, um, as indeed they have been also in the discussions about mental health. So um, I think that these issues prevail pretty much anywhere uh, in any country. 
yeah it is it is true um and so let's start with that i uh went through your article and some of the things that you mentioned i could see that they're so universal i could totally relate to it myself and i'm a burnout coach uh where lots of academics come to me with struggles around burnout but burnout never happens on its own so there is always this toxic work culture involved in it unfortunately and they bring these stories as well so i could recognize many people that i know in this article and uh this this fear of leaving that's why you call it the courage of leaving. well actually i have to say that while the article is um really my writing with really fantastic editorial support uh -huh. from science magazine um i feel pretty confident saying 70 to 80 percent is my writing and the rest is editorial uh, improvement the title is theirs uh -huh. They came up with the with the title "The Courage to Leave" because I don't think I would uh, easily have stood up there and say, "Hey, I'm so courageous to leave." You know that that was. But their you suggestion. were yeah, when was... when you think about it now to to yeah I mean that I time, what would it... you say is the title correct now in your opinion? I, it didn't feel like courageous at the time. It for me it just felt absolutely necessary. I was fed up. Um, and perhaps this is maybe we should frame the situation first a little bit. This was my I had done a master's degree um, at um, the University of Amsterdam and uh, did a biochemistry, wanted to do a PhD and um, I got accepted in, into a PhD. I'm not going to name anybody um, associated with this uh, particular story. Actually, that was also something that Science Magazine was very keen about, I suppose, for a uh, fear of litigation. Um, and so I started a PhD. I was really interested in the project. The professor was um, somebody who had a, a track record of really top pep publications. So I thought this was the right place. And But then it wasn't. Um, and I wasn't so much bullied by the professor or my supervisors, but actually my direct supervisor or the professor just completely didn't engage with me. <clears throat> So I was thrown in the deep end to um, sort myself out. And because there was, I think, no guidance for anybody in that department from the top down, that created a very pro protective of your turf and competitive environment within the group. So as a new person, you weren't inducted into the procedures or where things, where you can find things, how things work. You just had to sort out everything for yourself. And people were very protective of the things that they had achieved for themselves, probably because they had to achieve them all by themselves. And it made it for a truly horrid collegial atmosphere. Now, that's not to say that I disliked everybody. There are a number of people that I really liked, some very nice people. But just the the, uh, the 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 culture, the atmosphere in that group can really adequately be described as toxic. And then, um, so I started there, and it took me about three months until I hit my breaking point, and that is quick. Um, until I realized that this wasn't it, and that I wasn't the problem. Because that's the first thing you do is you say, well, you don't know this working culture yet. You're, you know, you start, you're just starting this, this trajectory as an academic. Academia is hard. Science is hard. It's not really supposed to be easy. Um, so what you start to lay blame with yourself you, in the first instance. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's well, <laughs> I mean, it, that is very much true of how that whole episode unfolded for me. Because when I then made the decision for my own and say, no, I am not going to accept this and I am leaving, goodbye. Um, that is still one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. That I've it felt immediately good. 
uh, whereas the road to reach that point was extremely difficult. And I do want to elaborate on that because even with friends and family, and I do describe that in the article as well, you say, I don't know, things are a bit weird there. And they are all, you know, well-meaning and my, my family is incredibly supportive, but they were like, well, be patient. It might get better with time. You might have to just apply yourself a bit more. And, uh, but when I hit the point and I said, this is unacceptable, my, pa- my family was completely behind me. And when I left, I hadn't a new job lined up. I, you know, I basically left one day and I was at the unemployment office the next day. And after that, I think I spent some time waiting tables or something or cleaning toilets. I don't know, just whatever to, uh, to get some money coming in, but I had no backup plan, but I knew that this environment was was not good for me, mm-hmm. um, and a key thing that happened that was really the, the 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 straw that broke the camel's back is I there was a, a technician in the laboratory. She was a difficult person from the start, and um, one day she came running up to me, shouting at me for breaking a piece of equipment. I had never even touched that piece of equipment. So it wasn't a case of asking, hey, have you used this piece of equipment? Have you not done the proper entries into the logbook? Have you not flagged the fact that there was an issue? No, it was an immediate blaming the new guy kind of culture. And uh, and that, that was it for me. Um, that night on the way home after work, and I described that in the article, I found myself crying on the way home. And that's when I knew this is, I can't be doing this. And the next day I said, I'm leaving. And um, funnily enough, after I did, there was a, a young PI that they had recruited and he had uh, worked as a postdoc in Oxford and, and, and he was supposed to set up his own uh, research group there. I think a week or two later, he handed in his notice as well. And then that whole department fell apart. And in the end, the professor was fired. It also turned out that my PhD position had become available because the PhD before me had left that department Uh uh, owing to burnout. So this was absolutely systemic. And suddenly um, the HR department was very keen to talk to me and wouldn't I accept a certain... Uh, interventions that would allow me to stay and I said no absolutely not I am out of here I don't know what I'm going to do I might never be a scientist again but I'm not staying here Um, and as I said that is to this day one of the best decisions I've ever made Um, I want to say something about the time limit there three months very quick very quick to come to the realization that something is wrong and that is what really saved me because a three month gap on your CV is something quite easy to dis- uh, to explain away, particularly if you've just finished your undergraduate degree. At interviews, I just turned it into, yeah, I've, I've been backpacking, you know, chuck, chucked some clothes in a backpack, got on the train. And I had done that for a certain amount of time after my graduation but not as extensive an amount of time as the gap in my CV would suggest but that is I wasn't lying I wasn't I simply wasn't telling the full truth the problem if you stay in a toxic working environment too long I see there's a, a number of problems with that actually primarily I think the greatest damage you do is that you in effect condition yourself that it's okay to be mistreated and it is not okay to be mistreated. You condition yourself to accept what are unacceptable conditions. And I've seen it often. And I think in particular postdocs, but PhDs obviously as well are very vulnerable to this um, where they say, well, I'll just stay here until I've got my paper published. And then I will leave because then at least I've got something. Um, And then, of course, when you have a boss who is not really supportive of you and not stimulating you and, and, and bringing your career forward, they more often than not will drag out that process of having that paper or allowing you to present at a conference. Yeah. And then that, as time goes on, 
if you've got to explain a period of one or two or three years of being unproductive, then that makes it very, very difficult to go to a new employer and, and say, you know, why are you, uh, why haven't you done anything the last three years? Um, which of course isn't true, but you haven't done anything to show for. So and that, I learned uh, from sorry, my I'm experience. breaking you yeah. there. Don't yeah, forget yeah, yeah. what you're going to say, but uh, there's this other uh, situation too, where people say, okay, I'll just publish and then leave. But then no. that publishing one article turns into two and that turns into, I'll just finish this thing. I'll just like bite my teeth and go through with it. And um, it just becomes worse and worse and worse, right? Uh, so but, sometimes look, you there, get there, to publish, but... There might also be people, and I think we will talk about this in, in, in some detail later on, who might not have, not, might not feel they have the liberty to say I quit, who really feel trapped because they're on a stipend and perhaps their leave to remain, their, their, their visa to stay in a certain country is dependent on them being in that kind of employment. Um, so I'm not saying that what I did works for everybody, but retrospectively, I'm extremely happy that I didn't stay there for a year or two and maybe suffered a burnout and then needed another year to, to get over that or to get disillusioned with science altogether and not um, and not wanting to continue with science. And that was a real risk. In fact, when I walked out, my first reaction was, I'm done with this. Uh, if this is science, I don't need it. Um, and uh, so thankfully for me, the quick realization, relatively quick realization in about three months time um, made it, relatively easy to find another PhD position, although I recognize it is extremely difficult in academia that once you have quit and walked out of somewhere, particularly as a PhD, and you, if you want to pursue a PhD, to then find another opportunity to do so. And in fact, the article in Science, The Courage to Leave, is intertwined intertwines my story with that of an application we received from a young lady who had started a PhD somewhere else, wanted to leave there. She didn't say that in her application papers, um, but it became clear during the interview. Um, I think she had kind of cleverly disguised it in her CV. Maybe she had pitched it as a research assistant job. And then she, when she was questioned on it during the interview, she said, yes, she was actually doing a PhD at another university right now, but she wanted to leave for reasons she was not willing to disclose in the interview. I and mean, she did that absolutely correctly. Um, so because I, I, I'm also a firm believer, you should never uh, hang your dirty laundry out for future employers because that will make them worry. They, if, you, if they then hire you and you're not happy with them, then there's the risk of you going and publicizing whatever is wrong in their organization so you must be very careful with these things um nonetheless we we had interviewed this uh, young lady and um the pi felt her a very strong candidate but he was concerned about that aspect and in our interviewing process we always make the decisions jointly with the faculty and there were more faculty members who were concerned that that was a sign of uh, not being dedicated enough to science, not being serious enough. And, uh, you know, in fact, somebody in that meeting said, yeah, no, we don't hire people who've walked out of their PhDs. And I said, well, you do because you have hired me. I walked out of my PhD. Um, that doesn't show up on my CV these days. Of course, I don't have a PhD terminated owing to toxic working culture. It just... It's not even there at all. So they didn't know they had hired me um, as somebody who'd walked out of a PhD, what is now some 20 years ago. Uh, and, and so following up on that, I said, so yes, you have hired, there is precedent of you hiring people who have walked out of a PhD. And furthermore, I disagree with the notion that this is a sign of weakness or a sign of not being dedicated to science. In fact, I think it is exactly the opposite. Um, and that a person who has had 
just bad luck, uh, very much deserves a second chance. And she, in the interview, has shown that she is very well suitable for, for the position. So we shouldn't count that against her. And so an agreement then in that recruitment meeting was made, and then there was another fortuitous thing that had happened, and, and maybe for good reason there too, somebody who had worked in that department had recently taken up a, a PI position at the University of Jena. And I had a couple, just a couple of weeks before met that person. So a very quick phone call was made. And again, I didn't go into much detail about what is actually going on there, but I simply asked, say, you come from that department from such, such and such university. We have an applicant who comes from that department who wants to terminate her PhD there. Might she have a genuine reason to do so? And this person said, yes, absolutely. Or, or something to the extent I believe so. So, and that's, that's all, that's the, the full extent of detail that we went into. And that was enough to, um, to convince my executive board that, yeah, this was uh, somebody who, um, who was bona fide, uh, qualified and, and uh, engaged, and that we shouldn't hold that um, mishap in her career, which is none, none of her fault, against her. And in fact, she, she graduated two weeks ago. Oh. Um, and in uh, Jena, we have a tradition. There is a, uh, a statue of the founder of the University on the Market Square, where he stands with a sword. And everybody who graduates from the university, and I don't think it matters which degree, is supposed to throw a wreath, like a ring of, like a bouquet of, 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 of leaves, basically. Uh, some, some might have flowers on it, but it's a ring. And then you have to throw that ring over the sword. So we did that and it was a, it was a great cause for celebration. And um, she, you know, did a great PhD. So I think there is a real fundamental problem with people who are assigned to supervisors that are no good for them or just simply the fact that you might want to change supervisors. It doesn't necessarily even have to be a full-on toxic working culture, but just changing supervisors is often difficult enough. Of course, this uh, more often than not is mandated by the funding structures that underlie the employment or the, the, the reason the person is in that group. Um, but I know of many instances where um, it's not a good match. And I'm, I have many friends in other industries. Um, I have one friend in particular in the financial industry, and I think in, in one year she might have changed her job three times because she didn't like her team. That did not stop her from finding a new job in her industry. And actually, new employers were very keen to have her. She had all these experience with all these different companies. But it's an absolute taboo still in graduate education and in academia in general to just say, I quit, I'm not doing this. And I'm gonna you know, try my luck elsewhere because senior scientists do sway power over the kind of recommendations that you get. I am aware of stories of vindictiveness where somebody applies elsewhere, the PI calls it up, says this is a horrible person, boom. Um, when they were just, close to signing the contract and suddenly everything falls apart, you know? Yeah. Because um, in the outside world, let's say, like in the finance or whatever, you're working in a bank, you just say, okay, I quit and I go start working in another bank. Yeah. In a university, when you quit, many people think that you're quitting academia, you're quitting science, you're quitting, yeah, that, 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 that whole career trajectory that you wanted to start in but that's just a change of job when you look at it yeah exactly i think we should treat it much more like a change of job and by maintaining this taboo over quitting we are perpetuating fertile breeding ground for toxic working environments because at present it is a, a pyramid scheme with professors sat at the top 
and calling all the shots. And in, in, in Germany in particular, um, professors have almost unlimited power over the people in their teams. Um, because not only have the, the professorship, and that is a, a permanent uh, position at the university, but um, by and large, they also have a civil status, a civil servant status, wow, yeah. which makes them even more difficult uh, uh, to terminate, even when their behaviors are demonstrably uh, non kosher. And um, there Even is Belgium. a case. <laughs> yeah, th th it happens everywhere. And there's a case in this recent uh, magazine, Side Campus, uh, described this um, a, a, a magazine of the German newspaper, the Zeit. A case in the University of Göttingen of a professor who used to beat his PhD student with a cane that he had lying around in the office. He used to hit them. And he you, and and all of them thought they were isolated cases because they, he'd also managed to create a uh, an environment where people didn't talk with each other, and and this case went to court. These people took him to a, a civil court, and the and the judge in that case decided not to hand out a sentence more than eleven months because if you would have crossed the threshold to a prison sentence of twelve months or more then you automatically in Germany lose your civil servant status. And so the judge decided not to give a 12 month sentence because he felt it was not his responsibility to jeopardize this person's uh, civil servant status. I reiterate that this was a man who was beating females with a cane and still to this day maintains his, employ uh, maintains his employment contract at the University of Göttingen. There was another case at the University of Erfurt um, here in the state of Thuringia last year of a professor who has been convicted in a civil court for sexual misconduct against his students. So he was convicted. There also the university is finding it impossible due to the details of German employment law to get rid of him. He still maintains his working contract at, at the university after have and this um, uh, sexual assault happened at the university. In essence, he would demand sexual favors for passing courses and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And still, the university is unable to fire this man. So um, there is a lot, and I, I'm, I'm convinced it's only the tip of the iceberg um, that uh, that is wrong with the extreme hierarchies that we uh, see in in academia. And that coupled with this absolute taboo to say, I'm leaving, because almost invariably that reflects badly on the person who says, I've had enough. And almost invariably, it's their chances that are compromised. And this is this absolutely needs to end. Exactly, exactly. And I want to actually even want to bring the, the university administration into this, not only in terms of closing their eyes to all of this is happening and not terminating contracts and doing all of that. There is also, there are so many inequalities and so much unfair treatment uh, towards PhD students as well as postdocs that I'm aware of. For example, in Belgium, uh, a postdoc, it is a, a good escape route for everyone. Depending on where you're getting your funding, you have right to certain things or not. Mm. And you, you think you are starting uh, a new academic job, a PhD or a, or a postdoc, thinking that, okay, I will be able to teach or I will be able to do organize this and do that. They can just come to you after a, after a few months and a year. Oh, you just mentioned you want to do that. Well, your contract doesn't allow it. The people earn different salaries. Yes, yes. People are stripped this of uh, certain opportunities. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this has to do with you being a native mm -hmm. from the country versus from outside. Sometimes it is as simple as EU versus non-EU. 
but I also even see cases where you are treated differently if you are from another country within the EU. Like uh, if you're Belgian, okay, you can do uh, this and that. But if you're German, you can't. That's one of the things I, I also witnessed recently. Yeah, I mean, sadly, I also know of examples of discrimination and racism. And, and, and these are very much deficits in some people's personal behavior. But exactly. the structural problem that is really specific to academia, that some people are on stipends, and that, that creates complete inequality among the PhD students. Some of our PhD students have working contracts. Some of them have a stipend. Those who have a working contract, when that contract terminates, they have rights to unemployment benefits and other social support. Those who are on a stipend basically get a couple of months to bugger off out of the country before they get deported. Yeah. Um, and and to, to link that well, with the... Um... Don't forget what you're going to say, but I also want to talk about this, the recent news of, uh, that came out about Academy in Nature, where a lot of uh, graduate students and postdocs being um, abused by their uh, PIs or promoters because of this vulnerable structure uh, where they would like lose their visa or they would they, they have a lot of things to lose these people yeah. i mean it, it is yeah it is almost unfortunately a luxury that you could quit within 3 months as a as an eu eu national yes. right yes but that's right if i i mean if i had if my situation had occurred somewhere else, maybe in the United States, and I was on a stipend uh, rather than on an appointment contract, uh, maybe I would not have found it so easy to make my decision to, to just walk away. Um, to be honest with you, all those kind of ramifications didn't feature in my thinking when it happened to me. I was just fed up. And I'm, I am, I'm a very, uh, I'm a person, even though I'm a scientist, I'm very much guided by my emotions and the decisions that I make. And if, if I've had enough, you you will know that I've had enough, and 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 I will I will behave accordingly, um, which by and large has served me well. Um, I don't tend to crop things up too much, and uh, and and having gone through this experience of making a choice for my own, and having thankfully come out the other end successfully out of it, um, was yeah, it shaped my character. Um, in the sense that then I suppose I also had the confidence to stand up for this person in our recruitment meeting um, where I, I just won't stand for these things and uh, um, I will speak out against them when uh, when I'm involved with them. Exactly. And I, I want to commend you for that case. because the people like you who make it, quote unquote, in some way in academia, even after going through such experiences, they are the ones who can change the system inside, from the inside. Otherwise, yeah. with the current uh, way things are organized, you know, the, the certain special statutes of, of um, statuses of universities that have a lot of advantages, but also a lot of disadvantages in these cases, it's difficult to really... Um, make this big change from the outside only because yeah. when you are abused when you're in a, like a toxic abusive environment within the institution you just it, it is um it's the same psychology whether you are being abused by a like a family member or your your pi you just say okay this is not happening or i can't say it out loud or i don't know if i am imagining things or yes not. yes that's just, yes that's and that is the the same problem that i referred to before the acceptance and that whereas drew the parallels with mental health um is this is this is this my fault is somebody else's fault is this even wrong it's, it's, even it's wrong. Yeah. so difficult to understand for somebody who's not in that situation that you can ignore all these warning signs and and even whitewash them for yourself and even tell your environment that everything is fine when sometimes they might clearly see that things are not fine um and that's yeah that's in, in, incredibly difficult 
I do see some signs of things getting better. You mentioned this age, uh, this Nature article, which also um, describes the situation of a certain professor who won't let his or her student or postdoc, I don't recall the details, uh, go on holiday um, and then threatens that if that person were to go on holiday, the stipend would be terminated. Um, that article um, came out what, a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, maybe August of 2022. August 10th, of August. But there was one like from August 10th, but there were like several that came. Yeah, out. there was an accompanying article about what can postdocs and PhDs do. And, and the tenor of, of that article is mostly report this stuff. You must report it. Um, and even... It's tough, but because this is a game for the long haul, we are really having to reshape a research culture that we know is suboptimal. There's a 2020 report from the Wellcome Trust on research culture, and it, and it makes for shocking reading. The vast majority of researchers at all levels are very unhappy and disillusioned about uh, the culture that they work in. Um, so this is not something we're going to change from one day to the next. And I totally understand the perspective and the sad reality of the fact that when you report something, that might not necessarily yield the results you want for yourself in at that time. Um, I'm also inv uh, involved as an advisor of good scientific practice in some ombuds procedures. Um, that uh, go on at, at, at my university. And um, I know that it can, it will, it will always look like the student are, is in the empower balance and they are. But reporting will in the long term build up a body of evidence against certainly repeat offenders. And I've already mentioned the Wellcome Trust. I was as a researcher funded by the Wellcome Trust for many years, and, and they're a wonderful organization. I wouldn't mind to be uh, affiliated with the Wellcome Trust for the rest of my life, but uh, you know, my, my journey has taken me in different directions and I'm, I'm happy to, that's, uh, that's all good. But Wellcome Trust, I think is really, I look to the Wellcome Trust as the exemplary funder in the world, period. And they have made moves to include that any applicant for funding at the Wellcome Trust, NEPI, must submit a statement from their university that there have not been any investigations or accusations of misconduct against them for, you know, preceding their application. Or if, and I don't know the, the details of those forms uh, specifically, but um, they do inquire now into the background of the PIs, specifically as regards their behavioral conduct and i think that is absolutely the way to go i think uh hopefully all funders will adopt such a model by the example set by the welcome trust because we can no longer have this situation where clear cases of misconduct and i've described some excesses of that just a few minutes ago are uh, um accepted because that scientist brings in a lot of funding. So I see a clear responsibility there from the funders that we must tie scientific success in with proper behavioral conduct as well. And I see the signs happening there as well in Germany. Germany in 2019 launched or issued its new um, guidelines for good scientific practice by the German Research Foundations, uh, sorry, the German Research Foundation, that is the public funder um, for, for research uh, uh, monies, let's say, funds. And uh, they have actually defined in the new code of good scientific practice adequate supervision and career development support as a responsibility of senior towards junior scientists. So if you are not adequately supervising your PhDs, you are committing 
scientific misconduct as per the new def definitions by the German Research Foundation. Yes, now, that's how it should be. Yes. I'm so happy to that... To make this part yeah. of a lived practice, again, is a, a long procedure. The period for universities to implement those new standards keeps getting shifted because there are problems and people are arguing about it. But I have no doubt that it will go through eventually. And, and it will, as the German Research Foundation has stated, become a prerequisite for obtaining their public uh, funding for science to adhere to this new code for good scientific practice. So I see things are moving in the right direction. Um, the DFG has DFG stands for German Research Foundation Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft has not gone as far yet to say we basically want a certificate of good behavior from our PIs before they get funded off, uh, at all like the Wellcome Trust has done but I'm hopeful that we will see more and more funders taking on that model and I, I see specifically a role for the foundations such as the Wellcome Trust um, but there are many wealthy foundations that support funding and they can relatively easily decide to include such a requirement in their funding requests um and uh, because they're a foundation they set their own statutes and if the scientists don't like it your problem don't then don't apply for the money from us you know uh, the german research foundation or any public funder has another issue there because as scientists you're also part of the of the public the public is part of that debate and it's a lengthy political process to 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 set new standards but um wealthy foundations that fund research i i think are in an excellent position to drive the improvement in research culture forward and uh, and i see the welcome trust really once again um leading the way there yeah that's that's amazing i really hope that the I don't know if this is taken seriously at the level of like EU uh, funding, research funding organizations. There are several organizations that, that fund research at the EU level, mm -hmm. but um, I am aware of many professors who bring in a lot of money from such funding organizations who have terrible track record yeah. and they, they don't get fired because they bring in this kind of fun. yeah i think the bigger the organization the the lengthier the process will be to really affect change and and so getting this through on an eu level is um is something that uh, i don't even know how to advocate for that or or to lobby to make that happen um so well raising awareness via this chat even uh, I hope that's a step towards yes <laughs> yes if, if any Eurocrats out there are listening guys we need your help <laughs> something needs to change it definitely definitely um one thing I want to go back and you you mentioned when you were telling your story uh of leaving this this PhD uh within three months you uh uttered the word warning signs several times like do, throughout this conversation as well can we talk about these warning signs a bit so that uh some of our listeners who might be thinking yeah but my situation is kind of in between or i don't know if my work culture is toxic or oh, maybe this doesn't count so that they also um get a, like a wider view on things because i i really love the fact that the german uh funding organization that you mentioned the dfg said okay even leaving a phd student without guidance that is misconduct that is uh that is awesome so we can start with that that's a big warning sign no guidance you are mm -hmm. left all alone even that counts as as something yeah, but, i mean there again it's hard to draw a line. Um, it, it's important to realize that the new guidelines by the German Research Foundation set a standard, but every case is an individual case. And somebody's requirement for guidance or supervision um, will be very different from somebody else. And some people are extremely 
capable of being left alone and doing the, and and they work best that way um so you can't set these things too much in stone and say hey you should at least every week have a meeting with your supervisor or so um disciplines and individuals are different warning signs for me is i think when you're really when you start to question is this the right thing for me that should be a warning sign in itself okay um but that doesn't necessarily mean you're in a bad situation that might mean that there are um un agreed on or unspoken expectations or different expectations i have quite a few students phd's have come to me over the years and said hey you know i've got a, a bit of a problem here i want to do this but i couldn't possibly ask my supervisor that and i said why not and and so i think there's also the case um from the phds and the postdocs this perception that there are certain matters that they can't discuss with their supervisor and of course there are always you know there is a line where it goes into the private where that's not appropriate but um if it if it is anything professional i think it is often the case that people are too reserved in saying hey can I, calling up the supervisor or sending an email saying hey i've got this and that thing I'd like your advice on can we schedule a meeting? So in these cases, I've often asked when a student presents a problem, say, have you spoken to your supervisor about this? And more often than not, the answer is no. And then why not? And then we cut through the debris. And then so we have some, often you find there really isn't a bona fide reason why you wouldn't ask or discuss it with your supervisor, except for your perception that that's simply not done. And in quite a few cases, um, we then with that student went through like, OK, let's imagine what would happen. Let's let's play that you're asking supervisor and I'm the supervisor. Let's play that through. And so when we've done that, they say, OK, I'm, I feel confident now to ask. And then quite, quite often, a few weeks later, I get the uh, response saying, yeah, I did talk with my supervisor and it wasn't a problem at all. So oh, it's uncommunicated differences in expectations that are very often a problem. Uh, and I would really like to differentiate that from toxic working culture. And a toxic working culture is if you have made attempts to talk about something and that is just being dismissed or people won't listen to you or won't take you seriously, then then what business have you, have you been anywhere where you're not being listened to? I don't know. Exactly. That's certainly my philosophy going forward. I mean, exactly. It's, right. And and finally, I also want to ask this as a as a last thing before we close this interview. You mentioned somewhere uh, in the middle that you are a person who who acts uh, on their feelings, and you said, okay, if I don't feel okay, like if I sense that there's something wrong with this, I leave, and. Uh, I also want to talk about the importance of this, not dismissing your intuition that there's something really wrong with this work culture and there's something toxic. And um, I must add to that, though, that yeah. one should not fail to test your intuition with rationale, <laughs> particularly for somebody who's had an anxiety disorder, as I did. I was my life was dominated by irrational fears yeah. for a long time and I needed to break that cycle too and I did that with cognitive behavioral therapy which trains you to look at the rationality of a situation until the problem dissipates um so I would like to make that distinction yeah definitely but like you said if you have a, like a overwhelming feeling that okay this is just taking me to the wrong direction in terms of like mental health general well-being like i don't know what i'm doing here that is also a good enough reason to start questioning things because many people also there's a lot of gaslighting going on as well oh yeah you're imagining things many people say mm. or or like the the parent example in my culture where i come from in turkey the the obvious answer from my um from my parents is always yeah but be patient like like yours uh nobody had it easy it is going to be difficult anyway 
So I'll be respectful. And that is the problem. Yeah. And and that is also what I see if this if this culture is perpetuated, because I, I see a lot of PIs who are in that position. They basically are mirroring the behavior perhaps of their PIs. And you know, <laughs> if they struggled all this way to make it to a professorship and of student complains to them, then it's quite likely they might say, well, you know, you don't know what I had to do until I got to where I am. So in that way, this the behavior becomes self-justifying. And, um, and and that's a cycle we absolutely need to break, you know. Yeah. And that's a great way to end this conversation. If you have anything okay. to add, go ahead. Otherwise... Um, have I anything to add? Um um, I feel like being put on the spot now. I've never had a problem talking except when I've like asked to do a closing statement. Um, no, I've I just I've really enjoyed our chat. And you know, I probably didn't get give you a whole lot of opportunity to get a word in, but uh, but that that's yeah, the point. Really I'm good. interviewing you, right? Uh, <laughs> this is uh, like your hour to talk. And lastly, if people want to contact you for uh, whatever reason they, they feel moved mm -hmm. by this or they want to contact you if they're a university in Germany. Okay, how can we start? I mean, you can find my contact details online. Um, you actually raise a very interesting point there because when my article got published in Science Magazine, I, that gave me an international exposure that I really wasn't prepared for. And suddenly my inbox was full with people who were in similar situations um, in toxic working environments with abusive supervisors and had were looking at me as somebody who would come out of that and perhaps had all the answers. And sadly, I don't. Um, and I, that was at first became a very difficult period for me when I had all these people from all over the world writing to me with, with the most tragic stories. Please help me. They, and they were really pleased. And um, I then developed a mechanism of dealing with that where I said, well, okay, if you've made up your mind and you want to get out of this situation, let me see if I can help you do that in the best possible way. Why don't you, for instance, send me your CV or your application letter for the new job that you'd like to be part of? And we can see how we can turn your current situation into a positive to present to a potential future employer. Um, that was a lot of work. So I am not suggesting that all of your listeners suddenly send their <laughs> CVs to me or so. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit cautious, but I can be found online and the persistent will find me. <laughs> okay, let's leave it at that with a little uh, air of mystery around you, how you can be found. I must say it's very easy to find you online. You're <laughs> everywhere talking about mental health and academia and toxic work cultures too. Thank you so much, Hendrik, for joining uh, me today, for sharing your story and your views. And uh, you. let's change academia one step at a time. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your work and for, for giving a platform to these very important subjects. Thank you so much. See you. Bye-bye.